In this video, we're going to talk about testing and measuring real-world performance, and especially actually testing your theories about if something is faster or slower, or one thing is better or not. And in this case, I wanted to start by showing you what not to do. Don't get, don't fool yourself into thinking that all oh, this one way is so much better. Uh, and that's a really important thing because people do that. I think you know, even myself, I, I fall victim to these ideas that one thing might be faster. Well, the first thing you should do if you think something's faster is you should test it. Now, we're doing this on jsperf.com, which is a nice uh, way to test effectively, test, test compiler optimizations that occur in different browsers. And in this example, what I'm showing you right now is an example of what not to do. And what, I'm see what you're seeing here are these bars that are indicating that for specific methods of going through a for loop, and I'll show you the code in just a second, that this person is actually achieving millions of operations per second iterating for loops. If you see this, if this is what you see in your tests, and you can't even, for example, for a traditional for loop, you're not getting any visible results, relatively speaking, there's something wrong. And so, let's go look at what uh, what the actually is going on here. And if we scroll up, you'll see that he's got some nice tests here that basically outline uh, the different uh, you know different iterations going through a for loop. Uh, FYI, console.log is actually pretty slow. I don't recommend it uh, for playing, for doing these tests. It, it will skew the results because then you're you're actually testing the performance of console.log more than anything else. And in this case, for the for loop, we're actually trying to find out which for loop mechanisms are actually faster than the other. Or in this case, also, what compiler optimizations are easily recognized by certain patterns. That's also, you know, kind of what we're looking for. We're hunting for optimizations. So in this case, for the first one, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a, a for loop that he iterates through. He gets the value. He logs the value. Uh, you know, that's probably works just fine. The problem is, is that he, he put together, he or she, excuse me, I don't know who this person is, uh, has put together something that is trying to act like it's an optimization, but the reality of it is, is it's a bug. And instead of actually looping, it doesn't loop at all. It doesn't even call console.log because the first value in the array is zero, and it uses that as a Boolean operation to indicate whether or not you should continue in a loop. Well, zero equals false. And that's why you're getting these weird, weird uh, results because it's immediately bailing out of the loop and there actually is no nothing actually being done other than iterating the loop. So of course you're getting some insane level of number of uh, operations per second. So how do we, you know, how do we do better? Well, I went ahead and ran some tests that I think uh, my initial version of this was you know to basically take what he was doing and kind of make it a little bit more correct and optimize, not do console.log, and try to squeeze out where the nuances are in uh, in looping. So the preparation code here is to basically set up the array, and we we now have a, effectively a max length that it's going to iterate per test, because that's actually what JSPerf is doing. It's trying to maximize how many times it can run the tests to give you an idea of the operations per second. So you have to write tests that, that think that think in that way. Like it's that it's going to try to do it as many times as possible in order to figure out how fast it is. So for these tests you can see I went ahead and already ran them for you so that we're not sitting here waiting around. And in this case these are all pretty much the same. Now I would be in favor typically speaking um, and actually, you can see that in, the, in, ca in this case, this was the actual winner by just a, a small margin. I'm in favor of actually creating uh, and storing the length when I'm iterating an, uh, an array. And I think that's kind of the best way to go in general. But what happens is that the compiler behind the scenes, when doing standard array loops, actually is aware that by caching this value, it can make things go faster instead of having to call it every time like it's a function which is happening behind the scenes potentially. So you can see this very negligible difference between this type of array looping. Next up we've got the function execution methods which is I use this as a control test so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to have this function 
that gets built once every test and then gets executed uh, you know, 10,000 times or whatever the, the actual length is in this case, which is uh, the length of the array, it, it's going to do it 10,000 times and run that function. Now, as you can see, it's 51% slower. Well, that's simply probably because executing functions is a little bit expensive versus the compiler can just optimize this without having to create or execute a new function. And then we get into the standard for each method that exists on arrays and, um, now in, in JavaScript. It is extremely slow. Um, but there's some, there's some stuff under the hood that we have to consider. That there's probably some Boolean things that are asking questions like, did the result return false? And if so, we should bail out of the array. These are things that are going on. So it's still uh, not out of the game. It's just something to think about. Because we're really, really looking for, in this type of operation, squeezing out um, the, the smallest amount of nuances between every, uh, every loop. Now we get into some other ones, which is really interesting, is we get into the, the while and do while operations. Uh, a long time ago, well, not too long ago, uh, you know, somewhere in the mid-2000s, uh, this, when we didn't have just-in-time compilers, this guy was the king. For whatever reason, uh, in a scripted world where there was no compiler, this type of loop was the fastest, simply because... I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's just one of those things that now, because of optimizations, it doesn't matter at all. So what we found is that these types of loops are pretty much homogenous, as well as these types of loops are pretty much homogenous, and, and we can kind of tell here. Now, once again, I want this video to be about loops, but I also want it to really be about what not to do. Now, for some people, you might look at this and go, wow, that's so conclusive. I'm going to use the standard for loop, for sure. And then typically speaking, the old school for loops, uh, again, they're a pattern that's recognized by the compiler, and, and they are optimized, and you're not going to have to really worry too much. But let's get, let, let's check this out. Something is not right, in my opinion. There might be something wrong with uh, this test. They look fine. You can go over them. They're all very similar. There's no divergence in how the tests are run. Uh, they have the same kind of setup and, and, and running. It would make me want to consider using one loop over another. But let's take another look. So I made this revision, which is a little bit different. And what it does is it actually sets things up a little bit more. Uh, one, the actual variable that it's using to report the values on, or to actually operate the values on, has been predefined, as well as the function that it runs for those two tests that are uh, function-based uh, is also predefined. So there's no overhead when uh, the tests are setting up. There's no internal setup of the tests. It's all happening outside of the measurement of the tests. Also, what we have is uh, we're also clearing the result on teardown uh, for each test. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because you go in here and except for for each, which is again very, very slow. Everything's about the same. What's going on here? While i minus len is what? It's the fastest now? Uh, and they all look pretty much in the 22,000 range. And what I changed was I just made the var exist outside of this loop. And so why is so dramatic? In fact, you know, the, the total percent change uh, is like it's somewhere around 10, you know, or, or somewhere around 20%, uh, anywhere between 20 and 10% and, and, and let's look, see, right? So yeah, it's like 20% the speed that it was in the other test. Why so dramatically different? And this is actually, I run this test a bunch of times and this happens pretty much consistently. Now again, this is using Firefox. Other browsers may be different. But the key is to get an idea of what's going on here and why would these be so different? And why are they all the same now except for for each? Well, let's toss for each out <laughs> for now. That's an out that's a, a low-level outlier in this analysis that basically makes it so that you you know it's something you should like kind of say, hey, this is either a fluke or it really is that bad. 
But let's look at the other ones and try to figure out what's going on. Well, what I think is happening here, what this is telling me, is that it's very possible that this test is in some is some way invalid. Well, why? It's invalid because the compiler might actually recognize that I'm not re either one, I'm not returning this value, and therefore it doesn't this value doesn't even matter, and so it can treat it differently. Uh, or that the scoping is either a, a hindrance or a benefit to how the code can run. Um, this test might run inside of a function. It might even be just the test harness itself and how it works that's kind of going on here. Well, what this really tells me is, and I did some other tests, by the way, um, outside of this, what this really tells me is the majority of the time, if you have code that's heavier in the inside of a loop other than some super, super lightweight nothing, then these loops actually behave about the same. The amount of time it actually takes to initialize the next loop is so small that you really aren't going to gain any major benefit. And in fact, I don't even think for each itself uh, really is all that bad. But it would make me question, like, well, now that you see the control, maybe this is actually better. Maybe having something that runs an iteration for you, maybe your own for each function is faster than what's under the hood in JavaScript. So that's something to consider there. So I'd like to wrap up this video so we can actually go on to some more interesting tests. But I hope that you got an idea behind what not to do in tests and what not assumptions to make when you're actually doing performance testing. Because there's definitely some mistakes that we make along the way where we're like, oh my god, it's so, it's so fast if I do it this way. Well, measure it. Profile it. Check it. Um, the beauty of today is that you know, Firefox, Chrome, IE, they all have profilers built in that you can run and actually see where your code is fast or it's slow. And there's also JS Periphery, which is a nice tool. Uh, I recommend it for anyone that wants to just kind of check two ways of doing things. Uh, there's plenty of cases where uh, they're already up on the website that really help in kind of realizing one thing or another is faster or slower. But also look at what the person did very intently because like as the first example I showed you, it can be very skewed and offset in such a way that is incorrect.